The reason why I'm going, it was decided by the acting government that I'll go back to UH is because I already had a bachelor's degree. So I know what's being taught up here. And I know it's wrong. And I know how to exactly engage it. Okay. I'm going to engage it not being angry. No, it's called academic articles, law review, peer review, research papers, all these kind of things. So U.S. Army Field Manual 27-10 regulates the U.S. military during occupations. Okay. Now, if you violate the Hague and Geneva Conventions, like in the case of Lance Larson, his rights were violated, you would call that a war crime, okay? Because that's a direct violation of the Hague and Geneva Conventions. So under the laws of war, uh, land of, law of land warfare, chapter eight basically says remedies for violation of international law, war crimes. In the event of violation of the law of war, the injured party may legally resort to remedial action of the following types. We're gonna follow the first one. Publication of the facts with a view to influencing public opinion against the offending belligerent. That's our goal. That's our goal. Okay? And that's fully recognized as legit by the United States military. We're going to play that game. I'm going to use the university system to do that. Okay? So publishing facts called law journal articles, master's thesis, PhD dissertation, all these things. And that had an effect. And I can tell you that things have changed from 2000 till today. Yeah, with me. <laughs> Drastically. <laughs> Before I showed up here at UH, this whole colonial context and indigenous rights and ethnicity was a driving force as a lens of interpreting Hawaii's history. That has since changed. Okay. Uh, Umi has his PhD that he knows full well of what this information is. You have others that have, you have people that teach it in the multiple campuses. But a big change happened outside. With this, this is a book written in 1998, Nation Within. Notice it says, the story of America's annexation of the nation of Hawaii. Hawaii wasn't annexed, because you can't annex a foreign country during war. Also, you can't annex a foreign country by passing a law in Congress, right? There was no annexation. The proper word is occupation. Occupation and annexation are not synonymous, okay? Well, in 2009, this guy, Tom Kaufman, uh, he's a very well-known historian. Right? He changed the subtitle of his book in 2009, stating the history of the American occupation of Hawaii. And he's a former reporter from the Associated Press, and he worked at Star Bulletin as well. He also is known for a, a pretty well-known book, To Catch a Wave, it talks about the Democratic takeover of the Republicans during statehood. Yeah? It's, he did a pretty good job on that. But why did he make the change, the history of the American occupation of Hawaii? And this guy's an American, right? He came to Hawaii. Well, he says, I am compelled to add that the continued relevance of this book reflects a far-reaching political, moral, and intellectual failure of the United States to recognize and deal with this takeover of Hawaii. In the book's subtitle, the word annexation has been replaced by the word occupation, referring to America's occupation of Hawaii. Where annexation connotes legality by mutual agreement, the act was not mutual and therefore not legal. Since by definition of international law, there was no annexation, we are then left with the word occupation. In making this change, I have embraced the logical conclusion of my research into the events of 1893 to 1898 in Honolulu and Washington. I am prompted to take this step by a growing body of historical work by a new generation of Native Hawaiian scholars. Dr. Keanu Sai writes, so he's going to cite one of my larger articles. The challenge for the fields of political science, history, and law is to distinguish between the rule of law and the politics of power, end quote. He concludes, in the history of Hawaii, the might of the United States does not make it right. Now, Duke University, just last year, republished that book. And it, no change. And then I was contacted by the Hawaiian Journal of History here in Hawaii to write a book review for Tom Kaufman. So that just came out. So pretty cool when you have a PhD. It kind of asks you to say, you know, hey, can you write a book review? I wrote everything a few book reviews as well as other articles. But Tom Kaufman, that was a major change major flip. Actually, I know Tom. And Tom called me before he made that change. And he was telling me what he was going to do. And he tells me that as an American, it was hard for him to accept that. That's what he said. It was hard for him. But he said he couldn't deny it. And he had to make it right because of what's going on at the University of Hawaii. So that was pretty cool. Now, last year in 2017, the Hawaii State Teachers Association Hawaii State Teachers Association is a union of public school teachers in Hawaii, okay? And they're part of the NEA, the National Education Association. 
which is the Union of Public School Teachers and Administrators across America. And it's one of the largest labor unions in America with roughly 3.2 million members, okay? Every year, they meet in a convention and they take up issues. Well, the Hawaii State Teachers Association put out a resolution and it passed. And this is from their Facebook, Hawaii State Teachers Association. It says, today, the National Education Association's representative assembly meeting in Boston on July 4th, actually it was the 4th of July, approved new business item number 37. Quote, the NEA will publish an article that documents the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893, the prolonged illegal occupation of the United States in the Hawaiian kingdom, and the harmful effects that this occupation has had on the Hawaiian people and resources of the land. That's big. That was passed in America by delegates of American teachers in America, along with Hawaii's delegates. And he goes on to say, Mahalo to Chris Santamaro, this is him, one of the delegates, a teacher at Kaneohe, who introduced the proposal, and Uluhane Wai Ali Ali, is Uluhane from Molokai, whose impassioned and articulate argument in favor of the Hawaiian overthrow measure swayed a majority of teachers from across the country to support it. Then came the first article. It's going to have three articles. The first article came out on April 2nd, 2018. The Illegal Overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom Government, published by the NEA. And the final paragraph sums it all up. Despite the unprecedented, prolonged nature of the illegal occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom by the United States, the Hawaiian state, as a subject of international law, is afforded all the protection that international law provides. Belligerent occupation, concludes Judge Crawford, does not affect the continuity of the state, even when there exists no government claiming to represent the occupied state. Without a treaty of peace, the laws of war and neutrality would continue to apply. Now, this is the NEA that came out with that. And they have to verify everything in this article was correct. And it got published. Then on October 1st, they came out with their second article last month. The U.S. occupation of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And now they're going to make reference to a U.N. letter. Do they know about the Desires' letter? No. Okay. I'll, that's yeah, going to be the no, next it's... slide. A UN official sent a letter, a communication to state of Hawaii officials, that you have to administer the laws of the occupied state called the Hawaiian Kingdom, not American laws. Well, this is referenced in this article. So it, it, the final paragraph concludes, a state of peace between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States was transformed to a state of war when United States troops invaded the Hawaiian Kingdom on January 16, 1893 and illegally overthrew the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom the following day. Only by way of a treaty of peace can the state of affairs be transformed back to a state of peace. The 1907 Hague Convention No. 4 and the 1949 Geneva Convention No. 4 mentioned by the UN official regulate the occupied state during a state of war. So here's the NEA acknowledging that Hawaii is in a state of war with the United States. Right? And that UN official that they're referencing is this guy right here, Dr. Desaius who is a UN independent expert. Independent experts and special rapporteurs are synonymous. And when they speak, they speak on behalf of the United Nations. These independent experts and special rapporteurs are elected or appointed by election from the Human Rights Council, made up of, I believe, 48 countries. In this case, Dr. Desaius is an American. He teaches at the diplomatic school in Geneva, but he was elected in 2012 when the United States was a member of the UN Human Rights Council, okay? And he sent this article to two judges in Hawaii and the rest of the judges, the members of the judiciary, regarding Ruth Bolome, uh, so-called foreclosure case that's going on, right? He writes, as, pro as a professor of international law, the former secretary of the UN Human Rights Committee, co-author of the book United Nations Human Rights Committee Case Law, and currently serving as the UN independent expert on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order, I have come to understand, he admits he didn't know either, I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation state in continuity, but a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States, resulting from an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. As such, international laws, the Hague and Geneva Conventions, require that governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands 
must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the domestic laws of the United States. And he says a bit more, but that's, that's the hard-hitting part. Now, he says what you're supposed to do according to the Hague and Geneva Convention, but what if you don't comply with the Hague and Geneva Conventions? Amnesty International answers that. So Amnesty International defines war crimes. War crimes are crimes that violate the laws or customs of war defined by the Geneva and Hague Conventions. Okay. So he uses certain words in his letter called plundering. Okay. That is a war crime. He uses another word, enabling and colluding the judges with the banks in the wrongful taking of lands. Though that's being complicit in war crimes. But he's not saying it up front, but people who know the Hague and Geneva Conventions, they know those are war crimes if you don't follow it. And that's what, um, what's his name? Um, ben Benesti speaks to in his book on occupation. Well, the United States defines war crimes. Okay. The offense is whoever, whether inside or outside the United States, commits a war crime in any of the circumstances described shall be fined under this title or imprisoned for life or any terms of years or both, and if death results to the victim, shall be subject to the death penalty. And this is Title 18, Section 2441. That's, federal, that's the Federal Criminal Code. And definition, under definition, as used in this section, the term war crime means any conduct defined as a great breach of the Geneva Convention or prohibited by Articles 23 through 28 of the Hague Convention because the United States is a ratifying party. So you see how serious is going to start to get where the rubber hits the road? Now back in the Permanent Court of Arbitration, we all knew, you know, we all knew this. What we, did, what we didn't have at that time was the awareness that people had of this information. They only started to be aware because of what was going on that we started here at the university. Now, public officials of the state of Hawaii uh, take this oath. I do solemnly swear that it will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the state of Hawaii. Okay? Well, under the U.S. Constitution, Article 6, Paragraph 2 is what is called the Supremacy Clause. This Constitution and the laws of the United States shall be made, which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made, which, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state, to the contrary, doesn't apply. That means federal law applies. So that means Title 18, Section 2441 is supreme, because that deals with treaties. And every state official in any state is bound to that, right? Now, the Hague and Geneva Conventions will only apply outside of the United States. Well, remember uh, the definition of a war crime. Whoever, whether inside or outside the United States, commits a war crime. And that affected this person right here. This is Congress, uh, Councilwoman Jennifer Ruggles. She's an American on the Big Island. And basically, she came to be aware that Hawaii's occupied. She received a copy of the UN letter from Geneva and that she realized that her passing laws on the Big Island is a violation of the Hague and Geneva Conventions. That they're supposed to be administering Hawaiian Kingdom law, not creating American law in occupied territory. She wanted to get some answers. I hope this works because the video actually got transferred. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay, it works. <laughs> Good. Let me turn it off. This made the news two weeks ago. A Hawaii County Council member, Jen Ruggles, told the public meeting on her decision not to vote on legislation until she's assured she's not committing war crimes. Last month, Ruggles refused to vote after receiving a copy of a memo from a United Nations independent expert calling Hawaii a sovereign nation state under occupation by the United States. Ruggles has asked the County Council for clarification on criminal liability under U.S and international law. The meeting starts at 6 p.m. at the Kea'au Community Center.
Me this morning. She definitely created an, an uproar. And she actually retained an attorney to draft a letter to the attorneys for the corporate for the county council. They're called corporation council. They're like the attorney general level for the county. To inquire whether or not she's incurring criminal liability in violation of the Hague and Geneva Conventions for passing laws. And that corporation council, his name is Joe Camilla Mello, was caught. Because the questions are the right questions are being asked. And that question was asked in the context of occupation. And what he would have to have done in order for him to say affirmatively, no, you're not committing war crimes, is to show that Hawaii is a part of the United States, refute the UN report, refute the Larson case, refute everything that the facts are bringing out. He couldn't. Since then, Jennifer Ruggles has become a whistleblower. She's been contacted by other public officials in the state of Hawaii. They're all getting caught. They're going to do the same thing. Yeah. Basically, standing down. I'm not legislating. And what she is doing now is educating people on the Big Island about their rights under the Geneva Convention. So it's pretty amazing what's happening. What I like about it is Jennifer Ruggles is an American, and she's a woman. And her attorney is an American, and he's a guy. The only Hawaiian involved is Joe Camela Mello, <laughs> the corporation counsel, and he's upside down. And here you got two Americans saying this is not America, and you got to follow international law. It's kind of mind-blowing, right? Mm -hmm. But I get called into these meetings all the time, so I actually know all of them. <laughs> so why is it that we don't know all this stuff? Why all of a sudden it's just bam, right? Well, denationalization that I refer to. Denationalization uh, is a very strong word, and it's a war crime at the international level. Well, this guy right here, Samuel Damon, he's an insurgent. Okay, notice I use the word insurgent. I just didn't pick it out of the sky. President Cleveland, in his message to Congress, referred to these people as insurgents, not as a real government. What he said in 1895, under this so-called Republic of Hawaii that they formed, he said, if we are ever to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is to obliterate the past, okay? denationalize. Can I denationalize you folks into believing you're Russian? No way, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like Pol Pot in his killing fields trying to deprogram, you know, all those who still believe in capitalism, right? I can. I can make you folks fear me <laughs> by having weapons, and you might say, yeah, yeah, I'm denationalized. But no, you still know, right? Who can I obliterate the Hawaii's history? If not the adults. Children, schools, take over the schools. That's what Germany did when they were Germanizing Luxembourg, Belgium. Took over the schools and they were teaching the children how to speak German. And all they knew was German history. They were prosecuted and convicted for denationalization in Nuremberg. But that's what they're going to do here, right? Now this guy, Samuel Damon, he's an insurgent. He's also the uh, owner, the former, uh, established, the former, the, the person with him was Charles Reed Bishop. Together they formed what is what we call today First Hawaiian Bank. But who was Samuel Damon at that time? He was a trustee of the Kamehameha Schools. Kamehameha Schools became the flagship of brainwashing. The trustees were all insurgents. In fact, one of the buildings at Kamehameha Schools called Smith Hall was named after William O. Smith. He was an insurgent. He was a so-called attorney general. And there's a move now up at Kamehameha as people are getting educated, change that name of, the, of that building. <laughs> right? Now, denationalization by definition is to obliterate the national consciousness of the occupied state. You can only do that to children. Right? Well, uh, in 1906, a formal policy was implemented from the Board of Education across all the schools, both public and private. And the theme of the program was to indoctrinate the children of the Hawaiian Islands to be American and to speak English. And if you speak Hawaiian, which is the national language, like speaking French in France, you get beaten. And we hear those stories from Kupuna that say they were hit for speaking Hawaiian. It was actually a part of a policy, right? Now, what's interesting is there was a magazine reporter, Harper's Weekly Magazine reporter from New York, came to Hawaii and did a story on this. Yeah. 
for Harper's Weekly. And he visited three schools, Ka'iolani Public School, this is grades one through eight, Ka'ahumanu, Ka'ahumanu Public School, and Honolulu High School before the name was changed to President William McKinley High School in 1911, to be called Honolulu High School. So he visited Ka'iolani School, 714 school children. And at the command of the principal, these children stand at attention and start marching. And then they line up in the front of the American flag, and at the command of the principal, they salute, and they have to yell in unison this. We give our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. This scene shows a salute to the American flag which flies in the grounds of the Kaiolani Public School, which has many Japanese pupils. The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. Inculcate. Inculcate is uh, brainwashing through repetition. That's what inculcate is. This is my grandparents' generation, right? By the time it got to my dad's generation, when he attended St. Louis School, it's already institutionalized. He knew nothing about the Hawaiian Kingdom. By the time it got to me at the Kamehameha Schools, <laughs> I didn't know anything. Nothing. <laughs> in fact, I joined the military college after Kamehameha Schools in New Mexico military to get my commission as a second lieutenant because all my uncles were in the military. I had no clue that Hawaii was occupied, let alone I was in the wrong army. Right? But that's a shocker right here. But well, it's the truth. So in 2013, as a result of information being used in court by attorneys, where they're challenging the courts and saying you're illegal, <laughs> you're not administering Hawaiian Kingdom law, and they're citing the Hague and Geneva Conventions and Hawaii's history, the United States, the Hawaii Supreme Court came out with a decision in response to that. And this was State of Hawaii versus Kaulio. In its decision, the Supreme Court stated, Whatever may be said regarding the lawfulness of its origins, the state of Hawaii is now a lawful government. You know, you don't have a court come out with a statement like that. That's like a declaration. A court is supposed to come out with reason, logic as to a decision, not a statement, right? Well, two things resonate from that statement. First, what is the origins? What are the origins of the state of Hawaii? What's its origin? Second, what is considered a lawful government, right? Well, in order to be a lawful government, you have to either be de jure, which is lawful by appointment, election, designation, or de facto, a successful revolution. That's how you can become a lawful government. So let's take a look at today's perception to trace its origin of the state of Hawaii. The current view of the world is that Hawaii is a 50th state. The predecessor of the 50th state called the state of Hawaii is the territory of Hawaii that was formed in 1900. The predecessor of the territory of Hawaii is the Republic of Hawaii, formed in 1894. It's actually part of an insurgency. And then the predecessor of the Republic is the provisional government. That guy, Sam, that guy Samuel Damon, you saw the picture of, he was a member of the Republic and the provisional government. He was one of its so-called officers. So what is the authority of the state of Hawaii? It actually goes back to March 18, 1959, Public Law 86-3, an act to provide admission for the admission of the state of Hawaii into the Union. Main thing that you need to know and keep in mind as we go through these next few slides, it's an American law. It's a law passed by Congress. The authority of the territory of Hawaii goes back to 1900, April 30th, an act to provide a government for the territory of Hawaii. This has a direct link to the Republic of Hawaii. That the phrase, the laws of Hawaii, as used in this act, without qualifying words, shall mean the Constitution and laws of the Republic of Hawaii. <coughs> okay. Well, this is an American law passed by the U.S. Congress, called a municipal law. And this is the origin of the Republic of Hawaii, July 3rd, 1894. They just declared themselves to be a republic. These are insurgents that changed their name from the provisional government. And the provisional government's authority, January 17, 1893. These insurgents were propped up by the U.S. ambassador as a pretended government in order to secure annexation to the United States because what America wanted was Pearl Harbor. That's why this whole thing happened. It wasn't about sugar. It was about Pearl Harbor's military. Then in 1993, the United States passed a law well, that's a little off, called the Joint Resolution of Annexation. 
It's a municipal law. So in 1993, the U.S. Congress apologized on the 100th anniversary. Sorry. Now, the Apology Resolution, the Statehood Act, and the Territorial Act are all municipal laws of the United States passed by Congress, right? Correct? Yeah. Well, what is a municipal law? Municipal law is defined as pertaining solely to citizens and inhabitants of a state and is thus distinguished from international law. So municipal law applies within a country. International law applies outside of a country. So international law, inter means between, right? So international law literally means law between nations, not within nations. What is within nations is municipal law. Now, before United States municipal laws can be applied in Hawaii, you have to make sure that Hawaii was made a part of the United States, right? Under international law, okay? So, how can one country like Hawaii become a part of another country called the United States? Well, according to Professor Oppenheim, a leading expert in international law, cession of state territory is the transfer of sovereignty over state territory by the owner state to another state. And the only form in which a cession can be effected is in an agreement embodied in a treaty. Okay, so that's what international law is, our agreements between states, which are treaties. Okay. So here we have two sovereign entities with their governments representing their sovereignty. One will cede territory to another country, voluntary, during a state of peace, or involuntary, during a state of war. But here's the United States. This is former 13 colonies that became 13 independent states in a confederation. And in 1789, they gave up their independence to a federation called the Union. Well, how did America get all of that? Not from American Indians. They got it from other countries, other states. Because Native Americans weren't recognized as independent states, so therefore they couldn't enter into a treaty of session. Right? Anybody know the first large tract of territory ceded to the United States? Yes, 1803, Louisiana Purchase. All lands west of the Mississippi, okay? Now, that was followed in uh, 1819 by Spain, Spanish session of territory. Then up here, Pacific Northwest, they used to be British, 1846. And then Alaska, way up there, 1867, Russia. Now, that was all acquired through a state of peace, right? They negotiated. Well, here's this area right here. This is all Mexican. <laughs> oh, good job. A lot of people don't know what a geography is. <laughs> and they got that in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. That was a treaty of peace. That transferred all Mexican territory north of the Rio Grande that began from the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. A lot of people say, oh, Texas was annexed by a joint resolution. No, they weren't. The joint resolution annexing Texas in 1845 is what sparked the Mexican-American War. And then you had the Treaty of Peace to end the war, and that's when the dividing point was made. Okay. So American law in 1847 could not be applied here, only Mexican law. But after 1848, American law can apply. The same with here, French prior to 1803, after American, and so forth. So Hawaii, we would need a treaty, right, to join. So what is the source of Hawaii's annexation? A joint resolution to provide for annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States. The problem is, that's a US law, a municipal law. Can the United States pass a law annexing Canada today? No, it ends at its borders. It's called territorial jurisdiction. And Canada cannot pass a law annexing Great Britain. Now, if they can get a treaty, OK, now you got it. But you can't pass a law. Well, they did. <laughs> it's not a treaty. So in the, congression, in the congressional records, when they're debating this issue during the Spanish-American War, and three years after they take over through the Hawaiian government, Representative Thomas Ball from Texas stated, the annexation of Hawaii by joint, a joint resolution is unconstitutional, unnecessary, and unwise. That territory could only be constitutionally acquired by treaty. Then when he goes to the Senate, Senator Augustus Bacon from Georgia, so the annexation of foreign territory was necessarily and essentially the subject matter of a treaty, and that it could not be accomplished legally and constitutionally by a statute or joint resolution. That's how it works. Then how did Hawaii get annexed then? 
Well, the U.S. Supreme Court, this is what they say about American, about laws of countries, municipal laws. <clears throat> They stated in 1824, the laws of no nation can justly extend beyond its own territories. They can have no force to control the sovereignty of any other nation. And in 1934, they reiterated that, where it says, neither the federal constitution nor the laws, congressional laws, passed in pursuant of it have any force in foreign territory. And operations of the nation in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law. Because people thought we were annexed, and we're part of the United States, people have been looking at Hawaii's situation through the U.S. Constitution, thus looking at things such as Native American status, tribal status, when you're supposed to be looking at it through international relations and principles of international law. So basically, you might say we've been trying to explain a football game using baseball rules. Baseball rules, football rules. Once you start to apply football rules, the game makes sense. And it gets scary, because <laughs> it makes too much sense. <laughs> well, a little visual of limitation of U.S. law. There's Washington, D.C., Congress. U.S. laws have, uh, the United States has borders. U.S. laws have no effect beyond the borders of the United States. That's poli 130. That's what we teach. Intro to American politics. Ninety years later, 1988, in Washington, D.C., the Department of Justice stumbled over this problem in a legal opinion to the U.S. State Department. And they found the joint resolution of annexation. And they said, despite the constitutional objections, Congress approved the joint resolution, and President McKinley signed the measure in 1898. Nevertheless, whether this action demonstrates the constitutional power of Congress to acquire territory is certainly questionable. And then they conclude, it is therefore unclear which constitutional power Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii by joint resolution. Well, if it's unclear how you acquired Hawaii by joint resolution, it will be equally unclear how you created